So um, what I'll do is give you a bit of background on wildfires in New Zealand, um, a little bit of a summary of the type of research we're doing, and then our new theme, um, enhancing community resilience and how we hope to have more collaboration with um, Isa and with um, Maria Colasso. So something about our country. Um, we always think of New Zealand as being a small country, but um, it seems as if we're um, about um, three times as large as Portugal, so that was a little bit of a surprise. And I thought we were small, but as you can see, we haven't got a lot of people, but um, we've now got currently a population of 4.3 million. Um, we live mainly in our um, urban areas, but in fact, um, obviously the topic is wildfires and um, we'll focus on our rural areas. But just a little bit of background is that fire isn't part of the New Zealand um, ecosystem and hence that when a forest burns in New Zealand and we've got a lot of um, Novophagus or beach forest, um, it doesn't regenerate. So they are devastating to our forest, to our native forest. And obviously to plantations, we've got a lot of um, Pinus radiata plantations too, they don't respond from fire. So different environment. Um, our country used to be covered by a lot of forest. Um, we had in the order of 80% um, of our forest, with, um, sorry, of our country was covered by forest and that has been reduced over the years both with Maori, our indigenous people, and Europeans who came to New Zealand. Um, and it's now in the order of about a quarter of the land areas in both native and a small area of exotic forestry. Um, we don't have big fires, and we, um, we have quite a few of them. We have something like um, 3,000 a year, but the area burned is quite small um, on international standards. Um, so not the big fires of um, some of your large fires in, in, um, uh, in Europe or um, Australia or North America. But the fires are almost exclusively caused by people, um, really only less than 2% of them started by fire. But you can see there that the consequence of the wildfires are, you know, we have deaths and we have houses destroyed, we have forests destroyed, um, animals destroyed, um, but on a small level. Um, it's certainly not to the level of um, experience of, of big wildfires internationally. Um, but certainly a threat to lives and safety, both of the people of the communities and of our firefighters that protect them. Um, we expect this to all increase in New Zealand. Um, we've got um, changing land cover, as we have in all countries, and without going into the details of why, um, certainly things change over time. There are more people living on the fringes of our cities, so in the kind of peri-urban or um, wildland urban interface, as it's often called. And we have climate change, and the expectation is, particularly on the east coast of both the north and the South Islands that they will have more drought events and more storm events. And um, really we expect mm -hmm. to be um, more fires and more people at risk. Um, so the greater the frequency, size and severity of fires into the future. And this has been modelled um, without going into the details there, but you can see um, the prediction of increased um, number of days that's with very high and extreme fire danger. We've got a um, fire danger index that was developed from the Canadians that we also use in New Zealand if you're familiar with that. So you can see the, the orange and reds are, are certainly increasing with time and will continue to do so. Well, what about our communities? Well, in fact, um, most of, as I said, most of them are caused by humans. Um, so our fires are started by either land clearing or um, accidental fires, whether it's for recreation or um, um, whatever. The human impact, but certainly started by people. 
and with more people, as I said, moving into that um, interface of our urban areas. Um, but certainly, we find that our communities are largely unprepared for fire, and we say hence vulnerable. People tend to think of earthquakes, floods, volcanoes, um, and certainly not um, to the same extent of, of um, wildfire. Um, we've had a large earthquake in Christchurch where I live, and we repeatedly get them. And I hear there was another one this morning um, of a magnitude 4.2 or something like that. We've had 12,000 earthquakes. So when you talk risk, people think earthquakes. They think floods, volcanoes, tsunamis, but not fire. But you can see that um, we do get fires and um, we will get more in the future. Um, just a little bit of background, we do have a well-organised um, rural fire authority. At the moment we have 79 of them, um, an odd number admittedly, but um, they're changing them into bigger um, rural fire districts, so they're um, reducing the number. But we have a fire service for the urban areas, the cities, and we have a um, national rural fire authority for the um, rural areas, and then we've got our own acts of parliament that um, govern the um, management. So turning to research in terms of um, Scion, we've actually just celebrated 20 years of research and we were very pleased to have Maria um, present at our um, seminar where we um, presented for two days our um, research from Scion and also we had some of the bushfire um, CRC presenters from Australia who came and joined us. So it was a celebration too. So we started in 1992. We're quite a small team. We've all I've really only got about four uh, full-time equivalent staff um, and we've got government funding um, and some funding coming from our, uh, we say our end users, but really from our fire industry. Um, for 12 years, we had a kind of the focus of putting our research around reduction, readiness, response, and recovery. So we had the what we call the four R's um, as the focus for emergency risk management. Um, and there's a lot of research that's gone on in New Zealand over that time um, in terms of fire behaviour, fire danger um, rating systems, tools, and guidelines, and also since. 2003, um, understanding community resilience and recovery from wildfires. So really focusing on that resilience and learning from fire events. Um, we present, a, um, we are, we're very aimed at our end users. We like to produce research that is going to be used, that's going to make a difference. And so we have a whole um, source of material and I've brought some of these um, with me from my research, and you're very welcome to um, take them away with you. I don't want to carry them home again. Um, but you can see that we try and put things out in an easily readable form. We've got our scientific papers behind them, but certainly in a form that um, managers can read and understand. Um, so now I'll focus a little bit more on the New Zealand communities. Um, as I said, that people don't think of wildfires, they have low awareness, and hence vulnerable um, as they are poorly prepared. So to really try and learn um, the, what's gone on in New Zealand, um, we focused on three case studies over um, a number of years to really try and understand um, communities that have experienced fire and to use that as a, a means of talking about fire and understanding the fire event, um, how prepared they were and how they um, responded. So we've had one in the rural urban in interface, um, or the wildland urban interface as it's often called. Um, we had one in a more remote um, er area of rural community and we were very lucky with the international collaboration to have um, Pam Jakes from the USDA Forest Service joining us with that, and then we had another one in a rural farming community. Um, you can see that 
Um, there were fires that happened a, a number of years ago. There were small fires. The biggest one was only a bit over 6,000 hectares. Um, people were evacuated um, and um, essentially we were very fortunate. Nobody um, died in the process and um, there wasn't a lot of damage. In the farming community, with the hills, there was certainly farmland and fences. Um, animals lost, uh, plantations and damage to a farm park over those um, six or more thousand hectares, but um, no loss of life. Um, in the West Melton, with the one on the um, Wildland Urban Interface, which is close to Christchurch where I live, um, certainly there was a house that was destroyed and, and a number of other structures, caravans and uh, plantations, shelter belts um, and uh, fences. And then the more remote uh, rural community at Mount Summers, um, the fire was certainly more contained to the riverbed and it um, impacted on the farmland, but fortunately not on uh, many houses. So, you know, what did we learn? Well, the kind of things we learnt was all communities are different. Um, and even if you take a community in a rural urban interface, um, in one part of New Zealand, it won't necessarily be the same as another part of New Zealand. But what did we learn from um, the, what, the study that we did? We found that um, either people who had been there uh, for a long time and had, um, we called them, um, older lifestylers. You know, lifestyler is probably a, a New Zealand term, and it's people who move into a small block of land for the style of life that it brings. So they like to have the rural setting, um, and they generally may have a horse or a few sheep to just to eat the grass, um, but they won't be deriving their income necessarily from that land. Um, they generally have the new one, the people who are new into the area generally have um, experience from living in a city, but not experience from living in the rural area. And they're very dependent on being able to dial the emergency number in our country, it's 111, and expect a fire engine to be there very promptly um, protecting them. Um, and they're relatively unprepared don't think about fire at all. And then we've got other, um, what we've called old lifestylers, people who've been living there, who had often been on a big farm and had moved to a smaller area, maybe for retirement, but they had more knowledge of the rural area and um, more local knowledge, and they were better able to take responsibility and be prepared. And interestingly, people would classify themselves, so it wasn't us who was classifying it, they'd say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just new to here, I really, I'm used to something a bit different. And they could be there even more than 10 years and still classify themselves as being a new lifestyle. So, very interesting. Um, when we looked at um, the more remote rural community, and again, it's not all communities are like this in remote areas, but we did have a real strong sense of community of networks and relationships of people looking after each other. They had more local knowledge, um, they looked after others, particularly moving the animals, the stock, and providing grazing or pasture. Um, you can see there the women feeding the firefighters. Um, they helped people evacuate their belongings um, from their houses. A number of houses were um, evacuated. So they really helped each other and they really stood on their own two feet. They weren't um, certain the fire was fought by um, the fire uh, fighters, but they stood firm and they um, certainly looked after one another. Um, the kind of study we did, just to give you a bit of a flavour of it, so we looked at their networks, their relationships before the fire and how they handled things. Um, and you can see there a couple of comments in terms of what they said and they say you find that the further away from the main centres you are that you have to rely on your neighbours in a time of emergencies. It's your neighbours who are the, um, your first call. 
um, everybody helped everybody um, and everybody helped everybody else, that feeling of just buying them together. And you can see in the corner there, their experience is generally snowstorms, so they used to be isolated, nobody can go and help them anyway, um, and they can get quite um, bad snow there in the winter. Um, they have local knowledge, um, they've lived through droughts, some of the farmers have burnt off um, vegetation, and some of them are members of the local uh, fire force, which is a voluntary organisation. And you know they were worried about fire, they were conscious about it. Um, so a lot more similar to the old lifestyle is um, with connection with the fire. Um, we looked at them after the fire and um, we found that they certainly stayed connected, they exchanged information, but they did, um, so they were still supporting one another, but there was some financial loss, though there weren't any um, houses lost, quite a few of the farmers had lost um, plantation forests and the impact on them had been quite severe financially and a degree of stress. So we talked to the um, organisation that looks after farmers and, and also a kind of more social based organisation to understand um, really what impact it had on them. Um, and again, um, we thought that the fire itself would have raised their awareness and they would be um, expecting another fire to happen in the future and be better prepared. But in fact, though they had um, made some changes, they were, um, and that was the benefit if there was to be a future fire, um, generally it was not done for the sole reason of, of a fire. So they may have put in an irrigation dam or um, not, and not used fire as a tool to burn off vegetation. Um, or put it, um, bought a, a bigger spray tank for water, but um, not for the sole reason of fire protection. Um, the third of our case studies was um, based really around farmers, and we really just learned how to talk with farmers, what was important to them, um, and the need to actually give them um, some knowledge about um, fight, um, fighting because farmers don't like to leave their land in New Zealand and I suspect it's quite true around the world. They want to be, be there to defend their properties, to defend their animals, but you know to turn up without adequate clothing um, and maybe just a sack or a spade to try and fight a fire is it's, it's dangerous. Um, so really we learnt quite a bit from talking with farmers. And we also looked at their insurance, and this was a study we focused on insurance, um, and just that need for farmers to really evaluate whether they have got um, plantations and fences insured, and what kind of preparations they can do to ensure that when the next fire comes, that they don't have so much financial um, pressure following the fire um, and leave them in a um, disadvantaged position. Um, just to let you know, we've, we've been doing other forms of work too. Um, we have been looking at um, maliciously lit fires, so we do unfortunately get some arson in New Zealand. Um, fortunately not too much, but there again our fire statistics um, don't necessarily always say what the cause is, it may be unknown, and I think it's becoming a bit more of a world trend, particularly if used, people are using fire, it may be accidental or it may be people who are um, um, really trying to, to actually do some damage. Um, so we have run a number of focus groups with farmers, with uh, fire managers and trying to really understand a little bit more about people's use of fire and um, as accidental but also malicious. Um, so kind of in summary, well, what have we learnt about communities? Well, certainly we've learnt that um, it's not just a community in New the rural landscape of New Zealand, but there are certainly lots of different communities, um, and that you really need to understand your community. Um, and really what networks and what um, works for that community. Um, 
and we really need to be able to improve the community's use of fire because in New Zealand people are using fire, whether it's to burn off rubbish, to um, burn off vegetation, stubble, um, sort of residue of, uh, of um, crop practices, or for recreation, we want to cook our dinner when we go for a um, hike in the, in the forest or the rural area. Um, so that we're certainly using fire, um, and it's that safe use of fire. And that we really need to plan with the community rather than for the community. The community, we believe, are very much to be part of how we um, manage rather than just imposing rules um, and saying, this is the way you should operate. Because we know that um, communities are more likely to take it up if they're actually involved with what's right for their community. Um, so a little bit of summary there, we've learnt that we need to share knowledge, involve the property owners, um, use existing community networks, um, and tackle the whole issues and challenges collaboratively, so fire managers, land managers, the community, um, and involve the community in the planning, and then hopefully we will have better prepared communities who are also more aware of the risks and um, use fire more appropriately. Um, just the final um, bit of our old research, just to let you know that we've been also looking at um, how we convey the risk of fire to um, our communities. And we have, um, this, we call it a half grapefruit sign that is based on the fire danger index, and it's, um, either points to low, um, moderate, high, very high or extreme, and it does change through the, the season. Um, and we find that people are quite aware of the sign. You know, it's recognition, awareness. Ah, yes, I drove along and I saw that sign because so I know um, it exists. Um, but when we talked first with the fire managers, we said, well, you know, and what messages are you trying to put across? What do you want the community to do when the sign is on very high? You know, how do you want them to behave? Is that different from how you want them to behave when it's extreme or when it's only low? Um, and we found that the uh, managers themselves could tell you a lot of it about the, the science behind the sign, why the sign is pointing to very high, but not necessarily how they wanted the community to behave when the sign was pointing to, to very high. Um, so they could see that it was actually quite confusing for the community um, and realised that, you know, you can see the down on the bottom there, there's a uh, fire sign that's pointing to very high in the snow on the ground. Well, you know, do we believe our signs when we see something like that? Because one would suspect that if you tried to light a fire, it would be quite hard work to get it to go. Um, so we, we did this in two regions of New Zealand, and we talked first with our fire managers and then with our community, and that we did find that our communities were really aware of the sign, but they weren't necessarily aware of what practices they should perform and how they should modify their actions if the, the sign was very high. Um, and they certainly didn't believe the signs were kept up to date or were relevant. They felt that it was just to let you know you should be aware, but you know, uh, no specific information. And I suppose you could say, well, is that the role of your sign? But in New Zealand, we don't have a lot of other publicity. Uh, we do have a, a TV campaign, but um, it's just during the central part of the fire season it's very expensive to advertise on TV, um, television, but it's um, also only seen by a few people. It's um, targeting actually young um, males between 18 and 25, so they have it um, <coughs> close to TV programs, television programs that they think young men will um, watch. And they do have some thing through the radio and the newspaper, um, but not necessarily seen or heard by a lot of people. So the signs are really quite important. And you can see there that there's kind of starting to try and put 
other information on the signs because we do have a permit system as well. Um, so those are kind of some of the recommendations, um, the need to publicise the risk factors, provide guidance of what behaviour is expected because I still don't know myself and I've been working in fire for 10 years, you say to a fire manager, well, can I have a fire on the beach? I'm going to the beach and I'll be careful. And they say, well, it depends on this, it depends on that. So, you know, clear messages and simple messages, um, accurate information. Don't have signs that people choose not to believe because they think it's out of date. Um, and certainly try and be targeted with um, advertising campaigns and provide guidance on how people should change their behaviour. Um, so finally, I'd just like to um, focus, um, what is your, should I just say, any questions on the kind of the past research? No? All right, well just to give you a kind of snapshot into where we're heading, we've just um, gone through a funding application process with our um, government agency and um, we've been granted funding for another four years. We don't have funding just granted to us, we have to go through a contestable process with other uh, people applying for the money in this area and we're competing against the people looking at risk of volcanoes and earthquakes and, and tsunamis, the rest, so floods. Um, we, so we're very pleased to have our funding again. Um, my colleagues um, and um, so grant peers, um, um, Tara Strand, Veronica Clifford, and um, Richard um, Parker, who's leading our group, um, focus on kind of the, the hazards, um, trying to look at new fuel types, climate change, extreme fire behaviour, um, and also using fire as a land management tool, um, impacts on New Zealand ecosystems, and then my colleague Richard Parker, who's as I said, leading the group, he is also looking at um, safety of firefighters and he puts um, on their helmets, he puts video cameras and he puts heart rate monitors and all sorts of um, means of measuring the, um, the stress on the firefighter and the condition they're put in and he's got some quite interesting information coming. And my area there, the second one, is enhancing the community resilience. Um, so really I'm trying to further the work that we've started in 2003 and focusing more sharply now just on um, community resilience with looking at community preparedness um, and effective communication and the planning before the fire. So we're not so interested in responding to a fire, but trying to prevent those fires and have communities that are better prepared in the first place. Um, and I would really like to see us having more community preparedness plans in, in our country, and that's something that the Americans have developed, um, community wildland protection plans. Um, the one project that I'm very busy on at the moment is linked and partly funded by the Bushfire CRC, the Cooperative Research Centre that's based in, in Melbourne in Australia. And the focus is effective communication. And it's really looking at how we get fire messages across in terms of preparing communities for fire and you know, what works. Uh, for some communities and really finding you know, what the uptake is and really um, asking people well, what works for you, are you aware of the communication strategies that have been put out at present. Um, and this is something we are also using as an opportunity to fund and further our work in terms of community resilience, so we're looking at it in terms of networks and um, other strategies to build up that community resilience. And so we're very pleased to be working in a joint project with RMIT, which is the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University based in Melbourne. And I'm um, really pleased to have worked now with um, Maria and um, 
Maria was there in Christchurch when we were working on adapting the methodology that was developed by um, the Australians and trying to focus it for New Zealand communities and she was with us and assisted us on our first case study um, in um, community in Nelson at the north of our South Island. So we were very um, pleased to have Maria and um, my colleague Mary Hart and I very much missed her for the next two case studies that we've done with her support and keeping us cheery through the process. Um, so the Australians have done 12 case studies. They've um, done them across four different states. Um, and um, we've now completed three of them. One in the rural wildland and urban interface, one in a more of a tourist community, um, and one in a more of a remote rural community. And um, Maria has um, been showing me the report she's writing on um, three case studies in Portugal. I won't attempt to pronounce the uh, <laughs> parish names or municipalities of uh, Portugal, so it would be an embarrassment. So, but um, we're very much looking forward to being able to um, share this, um, see where we have similarities, similar themes developing, and obviously we will consider the differences. Um, so we really hope that extending this research um, will lead to community resilience and because we're putting the material out in a form that our fire managers really can understand the lessons that we put forward, um, we really hope that it will be um, make a difference in our communities. And um, really I suppose that whole focus of trying to build up awareness but um, preparedness for communities um, in terms of wildfire but in the context of other natural hazards so not only for wildfire because obviously if you prepare for fire um, or you can prepare for earthquakes um, some of the strategies are quite similar and um, really just to leave it with our vision for the future to work with these communities to understand the risks and the strengths, um, develop community preparedness plans and we're now bringing in fire smart or uh, developed from the system of uh, firewise in this America, um, US and um, also really as I said at the start is the importance of international sharing and um, the ability to have collaborative research. So I just leave that there with my acknowledgements, but thank you for the opportunity to present and I'm happy to answer any questions or talk with you later, whatever. Thank you.